Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and let's get ready for EJ Boxing Live. How you doing, fight fans? EJ Boxing Live here, so uh, we're going to do another cover of, of uh, Boxers Legit Badasses coming at number eight, Ruben Hurricane Carter. Um, so, yeah, man, I mean, we just continue this. Um, I'm sure my audio is right. I'm sure my audio is okay. Yeah, so trumped up charges against Ruben Hurricane Carter. Um, yeah, so we're gonna cover it, get some a take on it, and then obviously give our opinion. Um, all right, so let's get to it. I've been locked up for 30 years. One thing the film does is it does soften and glorify Ruben to an extent that doesn't show the full nature of the human being. He put me in prison. Love's gonna bust me out. There was a lot of fiction in the movie. The true story is much more critical for our understanding. There are a lot of uh, places in the movie where Hollywood took a lot of editorial licenses to make the movie what they wanted to make it. The one great disservice, in my opinion, that that movie is guilty of was they portrayed Vincent de Simone, who was the real investigator in the Carter case, as having hounded him Javert-like all of his life. Not true. Vincent de Simone yeah. did not know Hurricane Carter until the Lafayette Bar Grill and murders. It is easy to create a morality tale out of Ruben's life, where you have the good guys and the bad guys, and how good finally triumphs over evil. The real story is much messier and much darker. Yeah, I thought he was an angry, jailhouse, intimidator type guy. I was bald-headed when other people were not bald. I was Fu Manchu when other people were not wearing Fu Manchu. I was mean as a rattlesnake. Anytime uh, black men assert themselves in society, we always recognize that some of the consequences may be deleterious, they may be deadly. He was outspoken, menacing, and angry. Three no-nos for a powerfully built black man during the riot-torn 60s. But personality, antisocial or otherwise, hardly placed veteran middleweight Reuben Hurricane Carter at the scene of a bloodbath in Patterson, New Jersey. At approximately 2.30 a.m. on... All right, so we're going to stop it right here. Let's get um, this picture up on the screen. Hopefully this should, this should come up. This is uh we're gonna talk about well actually we're gonna show <laughs> we're gonna show the feed of what they're talking about now so I'm gonna move this thing out of the screen. Talk about the murders. Pretty deep, man. Pretty deep. We're getting in, we're getting in, man. Alright, that should be on the screen right now. So so you get an idea of what they're talking about. Alright. On June 17th, 1966, two men entered the uh, Lafayette Bar and Grill at East 18th Street and Lafayette Street. One in the front door, one in the side door, without saying a word, began firing weapons, killing two men instantly and wounding a man and a woman. You had these four people lying on the floor, their guts literally spilling out of them, blood pulling up around the entire floor, so that when the first uh, driver came from the ambulance, he opened the door, stepped inside, he literally slid across the floor because there was so much blood on the ground. Shortly after 3 a.m., Patterson police pulled over a car with two black men inside. I saw a 19... All right, so the two black men, can you pull that up? Pull that up as well. Pull that up as well. That's what they're talking about. So you guys get an idea what they're talking about. There's my guy. We're gonna hear from one of the, we're gonna hear from one of the guys as well. So they pulled up these two here. Bear with me guys. Um I'm just getting ready to go on the screen. As you can see there's all really things on top. So they pulled over these two here. Alright, we'll get to them. 
66 white Dodge drive up with a police car behind it. Seated in the vehicle were Reuben Carter and John Artis. Reuben was asking the question, what's going on? What's this all about? Why did you bring us here? At 19 years old and never having any interaction with the police, I'm scared out of my wits. They brought us to the hospital with the, to be looked at by this man. I still didn't understand what was going on. They asked this man who's lying on the gurney if he recognizes Ruben. And, and they asked him, was this the man who shot you this evening? And the man shakes his head. He says, no. After passing a lie detector test conducted in the police station, Carter and Artis were released. I felt as though if I did not commit a crime, that you can't put me in jail. I really thought that that was the end of it, that I, I wouldn't hear any more about it. Two or three weeks later, Detective DeSimone, who's running this investigation, appears before Graham. All right, let's go back to that back guy here. Let's see this guy, this guy, man. There, oh, there, oh, there. Tell you, man. This, this is detective. Injury and says Reuben and John could not have been the killers. They don't fit the identifications. They had no weapons, and they certainly didn't have time to change their clothes and drop their weapons. He did say that before the grand jury, but later he said that as the evidence mounted, the state reevaluated its position, as it does in any crime, any murder case. Well, there was enormous pressure by the mayor, Frank Graves, to find the killers. Uh, they couldn't tolerate this specter of blacks taking control of the law. He offered uh, promotions and raises to any police officer who brought the gunman to justice. And certainly uh, these pressures contributed to the pursuit of Ruben Carter. Four months later, Patterson police arrested Carter and Artis on the strength of new accounts from alleged eyewitnesses, Alfred Bello and Arthur Dex. I don't want to hear no more. They didn't, they didn't run them through. Let's get, let's get, I don't want to hear no more. Let me hear this. Go to the Olympics. Yes, I did. Um, this is Artis. By accident, I met Ruben. Uh, he happened to be acquainted with a family uh, of, a, of a kid that I was friends with, and I happened to be at their home one evening when he stopped by to say hello. And that was how I got to meet him. And how did you end up in a car with him? I had returned uh, back to Patterson uh, from seeing some friends out of city. And I saw him go by on the street and I hailed him because I wanted to go to a club that was a little bit of a distance to be walking. Uh, and I asked him for a ride to that club. And, and he recognized me uh, as that track boy. Uh, and he gave me a ride to a, uh, a club that was called the Night Spot. And then afterwards? Afterwards, when it was time to close, um, we were all exiting, and I saw him, and I asked him, could I get a ride home, because I didn't have a vehicle, of course. Uh, and he said, yeah. He said, but if I'm going to take you home, he flipped me his keys and said, then you drive. Right. So you were driving the car when the police pulled you over? Yes. Yeah. What was that moment like? What happened? Well, it was it was kind of harrowing because I wasn't speeding or anything like that. There were three of us in the car. A friend of Ruben's had also gotten in. And, uh, and the way the officers approached the car gave me some insight that something was wrong. And as the officer approached the car, he asked for my, my identification of, of which I gave him. And Ruben told me where the the uh, identification for the car was, the registration. And the officer looked and, and, and he said, oh, champ, I, I didn't know it was you. And we said, well, why did you stop us? He said, we're looking for two Negroes uh, in a white car. And so we said, well, well, any two Negroes would do? He said, no, uh, it's not like that, he said. But uh, okay, uh, go on. And he allowed us to see and we went to Ruben's house, as a matter of fact. Uh, and from there, I re came back uh, to the inner part of the city, and I dropped off the other guy that was in the car, and I was getting ready to go to my home when we were surrounded in an intersection by all of the police force in Madison, who then, in turn, took us to the scene of the crime where their uh, crowd had um, gathered and made us get out 
side of the Congo stand by the wall. Uh, bodies were starting to be brought out of the bar with sheets over their faces and such. Three people had been killed? Two people. Three people had been shot. Two were dead. And, and um, two were still alive. Uh, there was a, a gentleman named Maris and, and a lady, Tennis. Um, but they were already gone. But the dead people were, were brought out. And then they took Ruben and I to police headquarters where they commenced to interrogate us. Um, and shortly after arriving at police headquarters, they actually took us to the hospital to be confronted by one of the surviving victims and asked the question, are these the two men that shot you? Although the gentleman had been shot in the head, the bullet didn't go entirely through his head. It went around his skull and came out of his eye. And he shook his head in the negative that, no, it's not them. The description that uh, they received was that it was two tall, light-skinned Negroes with thin pencil mustaches, both about six feet tall, weighing between 180 and 200 pounds. Ruben was 5'8", very dark skin, with a full beard and mustache and a bald head. And <laughs> I've never shaved. I still don't shave to this day. Uh, so at 19 years of age, my face really looked like it was dirty. So, uh, <laughs> and, and then we went back to police headquarters and we were, I was questioned for it. 17 hours, uh, took a lie detector test, which I passed, uh, and then we were released. And who framed you? Who said that it was you? It was the police. They had a, a vendetta with Ruben because Ruben had been quite outspoken um, in regards to um, poor people living in deplorable conditions and such, and more like the, an activist. Um, and they were somewhat out of sorts of Ruben because he was a successful professional athlete. He was the number one uh, middleweight contender, and he, he drove a very, very nice car with his name, Cadillac Convertible Gold, with his name emblazoned on the side. Well, why do you recognize him driving down the road? <laughs> yeah, and so, and, and they had. They they just had a, a, a quote unquote beef with him because he didn't bite his tongue when he spoke to them or talk to them. When you end up at the police station on that fateful night, what sort of pressure did the police put you under? Well, they kept telling me that <clears throat> if I would simply say that Ruben was the one who committed the murders or the, the crime, that they would let me go. And, and I just refused to do that because I told them that my parents didn't teach me to lie and that was a lie and I'm not going to do it. What sort of threats did they make? Well, the threats were that there's a possibility that I may lose my life by going to the, to the electric chair. So you're a 19-year-old man. You barely know Reuben Carter. You've only met him a couple of times. You happen to get a lift home from a nightclub. You're in his car. And these policemen are saying you could end up in the electric chair unless you tell us that Reuben Carter shot those people and you say no? Exactly. Exactly. No, that's a lie. And I'm not going to lie. Not for you or anybody else. I wouldn't even lie to save myself. No, it's a lie. Would you still take that course of action today? Yes. Good I man. would. Good man. I, I discovered integrity. I didn't know I had it as a teenager, but, you know, no, that's, that's an integral part of me. Just, you know, you tell the truth. Yeah. I was raised that as long as you tell the truth, you have nothing to worry about. You were 19 when the shootings occurred. You were just 20 when you were charged with murder. You were in that police station. What happened? Oh, well, uh, I was introduced to the mayor. Uh, the chief of police, the captain of police, etc. They took me to be, they told me what I was being charged with, which is three counts of murder and one count of atrocious and something bad he would intend to kill. Then they, they told me I was going to be booked. And at the, the front desk of, uh, in the police station, 
the officer when he got to the question of how old are you, I started to say 19 until I looked up at the clock and it was five minutes after 12. So I said 20, today is my birthday. Five minutes after you turned 20, yes. you were charged with three counts of murder. Yes. Now, Reuben Carter went on to say on many occasions that you, you simply could have said that he was responsible for those shootings and if he didn't, what sort of a friendship did that forge between the two of you over your lifetime? Over his lifetime and, and up to this day mine, um, it's a very strong bond. We bonded at that point uh, because the, the threat wasn't only to him, the threat was to me as well. So we got, we really got to know each other uh, after we, we were convicted and had to go to prison. You were sentenced to 15 years in prison. Three lifetimes. Three lifetimes. Three Reuben, plus. because that third person died. Reuben Carter, 20 years. You were given slightly less. Tell us about Bail and Muhammad Ali. Oh, okay. Uh, well, after all, nearly 10 years, uh, our, our case was resurfacing through appeal. Mm. And so we won an appeal for a new trial. 10 years. And our, our attorney right. applied for appeal bail, so it, it was it was granted. So the prosecutor in in Passaic County set a, a value of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars cash each. Well, having been incarcerated for ten years, I was broke. Ruben was broke. Um, we didn't have that kind of money. So Ali stepped up and said, "Well, I'll take care of the bail." When the prosecutor found out that Ali was going to pay the bail, he went to the judge and said, raise the bail to $250,000 each. And so the day that we went to, to, to the hearing for the appeal bail, Ali walked into the courtroom with a suitcase that had $500,000 in cash in it and put it on the defense table. When the prosecutor saw that, it was evident to him that whatever the, the value of the bail was, we were going to make it. So he told the judge, I don't care what you said it at, Your Honor, whatever, it's at your discretion. Hence, it ended up being 15000 for you and only 10000 for me. Only 10000 Muhammad Ali yeah. in a room with $500,000 in cash. In no. cash. <laughs> in a suitcase. An unbelievable story that I don't think has ever been told. No, 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 well, no. Well, only the people that were in the courtroom that day, the attorneys, myself, and and family members <laughs> along with Ruben, you know, are the only people that saw that uh, when he opened that case. John and, Ruben went on to become a, a, a star of sorts. He wrote about it. Bob Dylan sang the song. Here comes the story the of the man who thought he's changed the name. Not in the spotlight so much, I would imagine. What has your life been like since you got out of prison? Well, um, of course, I, I'll always be associated and known uh, with the connection to Ruben. Uh, but it, it doesn't bother me. The, the paramount thing that I was concerned about was, was clearing my name yeah. and my family name and getting out of, out of prison, which occurred. Um, I, I have ventured off into helping juveniles uh, for a working career. Uh, to try to keep them out of, out of the same situation that occurred to me. From 19 to 35, I was incarcerated. I did things in the institution, uh, like there's a program that I was associated with the Lifers Group. Uh, we call it Scared Straight, but it, and that's what it, what happened when uh, Hollywood showed up, and it, it became a, a documentary on TV for which we won a, a, an Oscar uh, for. Scared straight. Scared straight, yeah. I'll look that one up. And before I let you go, Lindy Chamberlain, you were in WA here in Western Australia about seven years ago for the Wrongful Conviction Conference. You met Lindy Chamberlain there. I was thinking of her a few weeks ago when a dingo took a small child from Fraser Island. Yeah. She was wrongfully convicted by many, many people who are watching us tonight. But yeah, we ain't trying to talk about that right now. We, we're going back to the hurricane, man. Um, let's see, let's, let's, let's talk about some of the other things. Oh.
Nintendo Fire Man. Done man. Slowly done. Let's see if I can get a bit more. He's still passed away though. Imagine being accused of murdering three people in a park of New Jersey. This is what happened to Robin the Hurricane Carter, whose story we will see right now. He was born on May 6, 1937 and lived on New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's this concept? You know, people are out there. They had a good fight with Georgie Benton as well. It's a very good fight. With, uh, Ruben Hurricane Carter became a professional boxer after several run-ins with the law as a young man. He was known for his devastating left hook, yep. but his career came to an abrupt end when he was arrested in 1966. As depicted in a film starring Denzel Washington, Carter was convicted of a triple murder by an all-white jury, largely on the testimony of two thieves who later withdrew their stories. His case became a symbol of racial injustice in the 1970s. Fellow boxer Muhammad Ali spoke out on his behalf, and Bob Dylan immortalized his story in song. <laughs> Terrible man. This leads to a life of living death. And there is no other way to describe the nature of a prison. Prison destroys everything that is valuable in a human being. After his release, Carter moved to Toronto, where he spent the rest of his life campaigning on behalf of prisoners that he thought had been wronged by the system, just as he was. Yeah. Well, when you die of the Fernando Fonte, Florentino. Fernando, uh, uh, Florentino Fernando. One second. I hear I'm the principal. From person. Let me go to the, my right first, from Miami Beach, Florida, wearing black socks. Yes, yeah, sir. Florentino Fernandez. Florentino yes, Fernandez. The only thing this commentary is raw, man. New Jersey, wearing Jersey. the white socks. He weighs 157, Ruben Hurricane Carter. Uh, Main uh, event, 10 miles. Not about to fire. Yeah, so. Carter, both you boys have boxed in New York State before. You're well acquainted with the rules. You expect a good, clean fight. Three knockdowns, and then one now, automatically. Yeah, you're so well. you score a knockdown, go to a neutral corner, do not come out until I call you. And if you're dropped, you must take an eight count. Shake hands now. Good luck to both of you. The young men are wearing eight ounce gloves. The party here in New York is on a round table. There's the bell for round one. Who's the hawk? Who's the hawk? Okay, look at this. That's it. Both throws pushing left up. This is a hurricane tool. You will lay him up. See this pic the picture you got on the screen? That's what it did to him. He will buzz him and he's going for the kill, boy. As a rule, Fernandez made something wrong for his left hook. But the parents are already the party. Ooh, he's not been bad already. This is the first round, you know. Eight. There's the mandatory eight count with more than two minutes left in the round. Ooh. 
Whoa. Whoa, he knocked him through the middle rope. Fight's over. Referee's still counting. Fight's over. He's going to die. Wow, he knocked him out, man. Yeah, he blew him up, man. There you go. Let's do the Emil Griffiths one. The Emil Griffiths one is bad as well, man. The Emil Griffiths one is bad as well. He just licks him. Emil Griffiths is a well weight champion at this point, man. He lit him up as well. Um, I'm probably going to continue this series probably tomorrow and think of uh, some more fighters as well. We get this done. Yeah, man. We ain't joking around. Come here from the beautiful Civic Arena in Pittsburgh. Yes, sir. Don't doubt the champion has won 38 of his 42 bouts. Well, well, he has got 12 opponents. That's at 147. The Austin Carter is 26 years old and has won 17 of his 21 bouts. He has KO'd 11 and was stopped once on touch by Jose Gonzalez. Carter is 5 feet 8 and the 24 year old Griffith 5'7 and a half. The weight Griffith 151 and a half, Carter 155. In just a moment, we'll bring you the 10 round bout between Emil Griffith and Ruben Hurricane Carter. That's what I'm talking about, man. Let's get to it, bro. Let's get to it. Uh, he won! Perfect champion of the world! What are we? Oh, we're, we're, we're bringing it over. Let's talk about the first one. Uh, I'd like to find the wall, Tony. Institution the fire is coming. Good 
Carter has a tendency to mess over the head with his left hand. Out under the auspices of the charitable Dapper Dan Club of Pittsburgh. Ooh, Milgo caught with a nasty left hook there, boy. You see it coming. Griffith facing middleweight has won seven of his nine bouts with middleweight. He lost to Randy Sandy early in his career and to Denny Moyer, whom he defeated. Ooh, twice. what a shot, man. Oh, he hits hard, man. Oh, he hits Boy, hard. He's in good leather here in round one. Ruben is hard, man. You can hear it, man. Cracking up the body, man. The winner of this fight could very well challenge for the middleweight title now held by Joey Giardello. Yeah, Joey Giardello. He challenged a good body shot. Oh, man. You probably noticed that uh, oh, it's down, man. It's down from the left hook. It's down. Take the man at four, six. Right, I'm surprised. Just about beat it. Just about beat it. Uh, Mills Gansford. Right. Yeah, Ruben's fighting, man. Ruben's Gansford. Down again. Second one. He looks hot this time. Round one. Nah, man, the fight's over, man. Yeah, they stopped the bar, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find the medium, boy. Find the medium, boy. But hey, hey, listen. That Ruben, he, he, <laughs> he had the fight with George Odello now. Are we saying hypo type? The old deal is getting really, really quiet. Oh, is it? Oh, man. Good is got really quiet? It is old deal. Oh, man, you can hear it, man. Oh, that sounds all right. Sounds all right. You already got really quiet at times. Oh, it gets really quiet at times? Okay. I don't know why that is. No, no. Yeah. Do we do a bit of chat? Yeah, the fight with, you know, actually, let me try and find the fight with him and Joey, Joey Diodello. Yeah, that's the championship where you said he got roughed against, man. I don't know if he got roughed in that fight. And this outstanding challenge, Billy Clay, Joe Fraser. Did they always need to go for the title of the year for introducing the guys in? A mellow bear. A party bear. Let me get to that one. He's getting quiet and gets blood, yo. The number one contender for New York, Joey Archer. Archer. Cool. Now, we got this. And in the corner with the challenger, Panama, Billy Wilde and John Peters. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. Ready?
sneak around if a man is floored in less than 10 seconds before the bell. The bell? Round one. Then. Yardello in the black trunks, Carter in the white trunks, Reuben Hurricane Carter, 12 knockouts in 20 fights. Yardello in his 127th fight. Woo! His first title defense. Experience, in the man. White trunks. Slams the first punch to light left hand. Carter is explosive early in a fight, takes a light left on the chin. But Jerry's got that movement, man. Carter quickly goes in and Giardello with a funny left work. hand. Funny he now got Emil Griffith in one run in Pittsburgh in a non title fight. Yep. You can detonate it. Wow. That's very quick. Both Smith and then Carter left. What he'll do is crank it. Who will crank it up? Let me do this one. See what they do. <laughs> Boy, great company. Oh, pardon me, Vic. Champion of the world, Joey. That's him. 60 pounds. The middleweight champion of the world, Joey Jacquello. And there's Joey, the champion of the world. And now Pete will announce the... Jacquello with a series of left hand. He knocked out Emil Griffith in one run in Pittsburgh in a non-title fight. He can detonate a bomb, this hurricane. Both Smith and then Carter lands the left hand, as you saw. Watch Carter, he has tremendously fast hands. Of course, Joey is the classic counterpuncher and boxer. Takes two hard lefts to the body. They say Carter is a hungry contender. But Joey is also a hungry champion. He's waited 12 months to defend. It was postponed in October, originally scheduled for Las Vegas. Hurricane Carter has never gone 15 rounds. Twice has gone 10. Giardello twice has gone 15. Feeling each other out, and Giardello likes the man who moves in on him. Carter certainly will oblige. Carter with a left. He's got a Dr. Fu Manchu mustache left from the goatee he had earlier. That was taken off just before the weigh-in today at noon. Carter, countering with a left hand, catches Joey on the nose. Giardello with an educated left hand. Joey likes to block, pull back, let the other man move, and then counter. But don't sell Giardello's punch short either. He's knocked out 36 opponents in 126 fights over 16 years. Jeez. Experience, man. Carter to the body, tied up against the corner. This way he fought for Rob in this fight, is Oh, missing as Carter backed away from that left. <laughs> Hurricane Carter, challenger. I think there's a lot of respect on both sides. There's a right by the champion. Carter trying to catch him with a bomb. Joey remaining calm under pressure, just staying out of trouble. Tribute to both men in a title fight here in the 15th and final round. Less than a minute to go in the final round of the fight. Joey Giardello, champion, Hurricane Carter, challenger. I think there's a lot of respect on both sides. There's a right by the champion, Carter, trying to catch him with a bomb. Joey remaining calm under pressure, just staying out of trouble. Joey just needling him now with his head. Carter missing a left. Joey ties him up, pounds to the body. A master champion who apparently is not going to be hurt in the final round. Listen to the crowd. They love it. One tremendous fight. Listen to this crowd. They're whistling and screaming and they're punching upstairs. Carter misses, takes the left. Listen to this fandom. The fight is 
Giordano, against Ruben Hurricane Carter in the first championship box of be telecast in five years. All brought to you by one beautiful bear, Prince of Philadelphia. When you watch a fight like this, you never know who is Dutch. Jimmy Neenan, Giardella, 69, Ruben Carter, 64. <laughs> Giardello, 70, Carter, 67. Three rounds. Referee, Bob Thomas. Referee, Scott. Giardello, 72. Ruben Carter, 66. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner. By unanimous decision, and still the middleweight champion of the world, Joey Giardello. A lot of rounds, man. He gave him a lot of rounds on that one. Uh, okay. Anyways, yeah. So that's the story of Ruben Hurricane Carter, um, his boxing career, and obviously um, his career of the being stitched up by the police. He wasn't half uh, killing and stuff like that. So, anyways, man, he definitely deserves a list. Boxers legit badass and number eight, Ruben Hurricane Car. I'm EJ Boxing Live and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.